As uh, Ray said, I lead uh, a nonprofit called Reality Co., which is coming alongside artists, musicians, and those who are struggling with their faith. And so it's, uh, man, it's a blessing to me. My heart is for lost sheep. You know, I, I love going out in the wilderness, um, having to like tent out there and kind of come alongside is where my heartbeat is. And so um, just loving what God has called us to in this season. Um, but I got to be honest, it's hard. And... Um, I made a vow a year ago that I would never enter in a pulpit again where I was going to be up front with where I really was that day. So often, you know, this is one of the things that makes being a pastor so hard is there is an expectation. There's a facade that's expected. I'm a mess today. Those songs we sang earlier were really hard for me to sing. Life hasn't been easy, and uh, I woke up this morning to be reminded that it was five years to the day where my mom met Jesus. And so I've been on the verge of tears all day long. And I was like, I got to preach today. Great. And, And I share that to say, if this is hard this morning, or this afternoon... (laughs) <laughs> this would be really bad if this was still the morning. Um, if it's hard, it's okay. And what I want to just do is just to invite him into that feeling, into that reality right now. For me and for any of you who feel the same. And so uh, let's pray and then we'll jump into God's word together. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I know for some of us, especially myself, today's hard. And Father, everything in us screams to be strong, to be strong, to be strong, but you are beckoning us to be weak. And so Father, in my and our weakness, we come to you with our struggles, our questions, our hurts, our pains, our disappointments. And we invite you into them. We invite you to open the door, to walk in, and to meet us right where we are. And so, Lord, uh, we ask for that now. As we come to your word, we ask that you would come and that you would meet us and you would speak to us. You would comfort us. And, Lord, that you would just pour out upon us your love and your mercy. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, why don't you grab them and turn to Revelation uh, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, we are dealing with the seventh church. For those of you who may have been here throughout the series, you're like, what happened to the sixth? Um, What happened is I had a conflict of dates, and uh, Randy was good enough of a friend to swap dates with me. So you're going to backtrack next week and go to the sixth church, uh, the Church of Philadelphia. But this week, we'll be jumping into the Church of Laodicea. So um, if you would, would you stand now for the reading of God? God's word. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, And neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, well, I don't know about you, but I am like a a, a news buff. Like I am watching the news, scrolling the news. And, And one of the things I like to take note of are the things that we see as threats. So if you're to look through your thread, if you're to look at the local TV or national TV station and you're watching what's going on, you'll see things like the threat of Russia or China, the threats of climate change, the threats of political divides tearing our nation apart. You'll see all these things. And it made me think if we went back into a a, a time machine and went back to September 10th, 2001, the greatest threat on the horizon would probably not be on any of our radar screens. For those of us old enough to remember those days, we remember the feeling of that day in the aftermath where all of a sudden the thing that was on none of our radar screens automatically came to the forefront and we saw it for what it was. And I wonder if we were to come and to look at the modern church to scroll through the socials, to to see those pundits and those, those talking heads, if we were to look and to see what were the greatest threats to the church, what would we hear? Threats probably about false teaching. Threats of cultural accommodation, threats about um, increasing opposition, both culturally and government. All these things would be the things that we would hear over and over again. And I fear the thing that is the greatest threat to us is the thing that is flying underneath all of our radar screens. You see, I would argue from Jesus' words to the church of Laodicea that the greatest threat to the church then and today is the same especially in an affluent culture. And that threat is success. And and we've got to ask ourselves the question, why? Why is that such a threat? And second, if that's true, why aren't we bothered by it? Well, I think the second one's fairly easy to answer. And the answer is simple, because we all want it. I mean, we know money can't buy you love. We know that money can't buy you happiness, but we sure would like to try, right? (laughs) Like if someone gave you a form and says, this is your life, I want you to write down what you want and it has this like check box and it says, it says prosperity, success, abilities. Would you like these? You'd be like, yes, all of the above. You see why it's so threatening is because all of us want it. You see, we know that ultimately it can't buy us these things, but it can temporarily, right? Like that moment you find that thing on Amazon, check, you feel good. Comes in the mail, check, I feel good. Credit card bill comes, check, (laughs) domas. Like, I don't feel good, no mo. You know, like there's this reality. Like it can buy me temporarily happiness. It's like going on a vacation, some of you will have little kids. You don't know what a vacation is anymore. You, t- you take trips, not vacations. Trips are for memories. Vacations are to rest, all right? So let me just remind us all of the difference. So if you can recall, like PK, pre, yeah, pre-kids, pre-kids, if you can recall when mom and dad took your kids so you can go out, is that you can remember the vacation where you just sat back on the beach, You read that book. You just experienced this joy and happiness in the moment. Money bought you that. And I don't know about you, but I've seen enough of these male entertainers, no matter what sport, genre, et cetera. And if you've seen some of their spouses, you can't tell me money and power aren't part of the equation, right? (laughs) We're in Nashville, so I'm not going to name names, but like, you know, like, you know, like, like these things, we know they can temporarily offer us something. That's why they're so appealing. And Jesus is saying, that's why it's such a threat. Now, I want to show us that from the passage. And part of how we see that is this, of all the churches that Jesus, Jesus addresses, There's only one where there's no commendation. 
In every other congregation, he can find something in the mix that, 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 that is something that can be commended. But when he comes to this, he says something is horribly missing. And I think that communicates something to us. There's something uniquely threatening when success, riches, or seeming super abilities begin to show their heads in their lives, both individually and corporately. And so I want to show that as we look at the church of Laodicea, but also I want to show it as we turn our hearts and minds to look at Jesus. Because here's the key that unlocks the whole book of Revelation. One, it's not revelations, plural. All right, it's not a book of all these freaky things that are happening at the end of time that just make note of that we're going to freak out and have like weird graphs and everything behind us about. That, that, that's not the deal. It is the apocalypsis, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You miss Jesus in this book, you miss the point of this book, all right? And so we want to look at what he's saying to the church through lenses by seeing what it is telling us about him. And so the first thing that we see is this, is that he knows us. Now, we jump in the church of Laodicea. And, and, and Jesus starts, as he often starts, in these messages of the churches. He, he kind of has a greeting of who he is, an introduction to who he is. And he introduces himself here as the amen, the true one, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. In other words, he's saying that I've got a, a unique insight and a trustworthy word on everything in this creation, including your life. And then he says, I know your works. You see, he knows us. That's a very comforting and concerning thought, right? He knows you. He knows your motivations. He knows the things that are seen in public, the things that happen in private, and the light in the dark. He sees all these things. And so this one who has this unique supernatural ability to know us better than we know ourselves comes and begins to expose the church of Laodicea. Now, when I was a kid, um, I remember hearing this taught and basically getting the idea that Jesus wants you to be all in or all out. No fence straddlers here. And I remember even as a kid being like, man, don't sound like Jesus. Like that don't sound, and, and, and the reason why, because it's not. Because when all of a sudden I was in seminary and I was um, given the task of studying these passages is that I saw, oh my goodness, the understanding of the context makes this passage explode with meaning. You see, the church of Laodicea was located in a city that was at the, 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 the cross section of all these trade routes. So it was one of those places that, that all of us automatically began to have all of the success, all of these riches economic prosperity. And, 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 and they began defining themselves by this. In fact, they saw themselves as the city of Zeus. Now, you may not know a lot about the Greek gods, but who's number one? Zeus, all right? So we define ourselves by the right one. You know, this isn't just a two-bit NBA player. We define ourselves by, by Michael Jordan, right? And that's the equivalent of what's going on here. And so they're saying that we are this. And this town had all the trappings of the major cities, but one very important ingredient. And that was this, water. Now think of some of the major cities uh, around our country. New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Nashville. What are they all located next to? Water. Las Vegas. No water, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing there. So this is kind of like Las Vegas. Like there's no water nearby. So they've got a dilemma. How do we solve the problem of water? Well, what archaeologists have shown us is that they found a solution. They used all of their resources and ingenuity to begin building all these aqueducts, these pipes from some far off cities. Two primarily, the city of Hierapolis and the city of Colossae. Now, each of these cities and their water sources are very important to the message to Laodicea. You see, six miles away, you had the city of Hierapolis. Now, Hierapolis was the city that kind of had these hills, and, and on them were these hot springs, so make the H's, 
Hierapolis, hot springs, hot water. And so these hot springs would overflow and they were filled with all these minerals. So it almost looks like it is freshly snowed when you look at the pictures of it. And so this water was seen to be a great benefit for its medicinal purposes. So people would go and bathe them to, to feel good, to relax, to, to find some healing. And, and so what the Laodiceans did is they went and they piped that water down those six miles to Laodicea. Now, now there's a problem there. Um, you've experienced it every time you got your coffee um, and you've driven like 300 miles. <laughs> like, like what inevitably happens? It cools off. Now, how many of you love hot coffee? How many of you love cold coffee? How many of you love been sitting out on the counter for three days coffee? <laughs> right? No one, no one. If you are, please talk afterwards. You need help and we will get you that. Um, you know, like, like no one likes that. And so all of a sudden the thing that defined it, that made it so useful and beneficial is now gone. Additionally, it was a water source that was filled with minerals. And these minerals would build up within these pipes. And I don't know if you've been around much hot mineral type water. What does it often smell like? Sulfur. Who wants to drink that? And so what would happen if you accidentally got the water out of that? You would spit it out. Oh, starting to see a connection? Now, about 11 miles away in the other direction, you have the city of Colossae. Now, it sat at the, at the kind of the foot of these large mountains with these snow-capped tops. And so what would happen is that mountain snow would begin to melt and to run off, and they would have these cool, refreshing springs. They began to be known by the quality of their water. They were kind of like Fiji and liquid death. Um, that stuff's ridiculous. Ridiculous. In, like ingenious. Let me charge you like $5 for a can of water. Um, but like that was it. They were defined by it. But here's the thing. Leave a, a, a glass of ice water in this hot Tennessee sun for enough time. And what's going to happen? It's going to be nasty. Like it's that lukewarm to warm. You know, nobody wants that. And so all of a sudden you see this was the water situation of the city of Laodicea. And Jesus is saying, you are like that. That you're neither hot like the hot springs of Hierapolis, nor are you cold like the cool, refreshing waters of Colossae. You're like that nasty water that's coming out the tap. And it's not the good side. It's the side that makes you want to spit it out. And Jesus says, the reality of your works makes me sick. Not very pleasant words from the meek and gentle Jesus, is it? And so these waters are showing us the reality of his intimate knowledge of the city of Laodicea and its people and his church. Like I get Nashville. I get the things of Na people in Nashville and I get you as a church in Nashville. That in essence is what he is saying. And so... He moves from knowing them to inviting them. You see, he says, there is a problem, and it's this. You are defining yourselves by what you think are your strengths. He says, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. And he's showing us the major reason why success, power, riches, giftedness is so alluring and detrimental to a believer and to the church. And it's this, because you will become more and more ignorant of your need. Because we got it. We can handle it. And so what Jesus does next is begins to invite the Laodiceans to begin to um, uh, interact and relate to him in this passage is directly related to his intimate knowledge of them and of their city and of the things they define themselves by. Now, there's three things here that were very critically important in the life of a Laodicean. The first was their riches. So as I said earlier, is that they were at this crossroads, this intersection of all these trading routes. So they were very prosperous. To kind of get a glimpse of how prosperous they were, cities that were five times their size 
were only able to afford like one amphitheater. They had two. They showing off. In AD 60, a huge earthquake hits the region, like decimates the city. The federal government, the Roman Empire, comes in and says, hey, let us come and help you. You know what they say? Thanks, but no thanks. We got this. It was a badge of pride that we don't need nothing from nobody. We got it. We're that rich. We're that able to handle our own things. And so Jesus is taking the background of this cultural value and reality, and he is saying, you have become culprit to that same line of thinking. You think you are rich, but what am I telling you? You're poor. And you must come and buy from me gold. The second thing he then points out is that he points out the second thing that the Laodiceans define themselves You see, they were like this textile and fashionista center because they had this kind of renowned black wool that people would die for. And so they they, they kind of like loved the fact that that they were the place where people would get this most expensive of wools. And so Jesus goes, this very thing you define yourself, the labels that you're wearing, I'm telling you, they amount to nothing. In essence, you say, he says, you think you're, you're well-dressed, but I'm telling you, you're naked. And you need to come to me that you may clothe the shame of your nakedness. See, there's, there's an interesting point here is that when often you see nakedness in the Bible, what emotion will be c- clearly connected to it? Shame. shame. Well, you and I must understand when we are pursuing the labels and the images of success, What are you trying to cover? Shame. He says, no amount of labels, brand names, or any other picture of success is going to cover that deep-seated feeling of shame that you and I feel. But he says, if you come to me, I will give you white garments of reference to the righteousness of Jesus that closes us. And so you see here that, that, that Jesus is so knowledgeable about the city, about their real issues. It's as if he comes to Nashville and says, I know you think you can sing, but girlfriend, you are all out of whack. Like nothing was in tune. Nothing was in key. You need to get voice lessons from me. Nashua, I know you think you're the it city. You can put on a show. I seen it. I am not impressed. Why don't you show up to mine? I'll give you a part. You see, he's hitting them at the very points that they pride themselves as a people and turns them upside down and exposes them for what they are. False counterfeits. That we're trying to cover the sense of shame and inadequacy and sins in our lives. And then he comes to the third. You see, not only it was an economic center and a, and a center of textile and fashion, it was also a center of medicine. In fact, they saw the medical field as, as so honored that they literally would put them on their, like, on their, on their, on their trading cards. They put them on their coins and their currency because they so valued the, 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 the industry of medicine. And they were renowned for a certain medicine. It was this eye salve they would put in their eyes. Well, notice what Jesus says next. He says, basically, come and get the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You see, at every point, Jesus is exposing them for who they are, not what they present. What is his motivation? You see, he knows us, he invites us because he loves us. Look what he says next. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. 
That the motivating force of Jesus saying these hard things to them and to us is not because he wants to harm us, but he wants to bless us. He wants to help us experience the fullness of life with him. And anything that stands in the way of that, he will call out for what it is because he loves us. Now, I don't know about you, but like, you know, back when like American Idol first started, you know, the most entertaining thing was not the gifted people, right? (laughs) The most entertaining thing was the ones who worked, right? You know, you're watching it and you're thinking to yourself like, oh my goodness, this is horrible, you know? And you're like taking pleasure in this moment. And and inevitably you'd have that moment where they would come and they would be interacting with the judges and the judges look dumbfounded. Like, how in the world would you think to show up at a talent contest? And and inevitably, you'd have that individual who would say, but all my friends and family say I'm great. And I always think to myself, you need new friends and family. They do not love you. Because if they loved you, they would say something and to keep you from the shame. Like, you know, like, like, like that is true. And the reality is that he loves us. He loves us. You know, a few years ago, I was being pursued by this large church. And I was really excited. And, and, and they came to me and said, hey, you're our number one candidate. I'm like, great. And, and, and we started talking. And, and, and one day, as we're going through this process, they call me back. And they say, hey, hey, Phil, like, we love the guy we're interacting across the table from. But the guy we see on stage feels different. Now, I've always like hoped to define myself as being authentic and real. And, 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 and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, you, it's probably some bad weeks. You know, it's been a crazy time. And, and so, so they're like, well, won't you go back and just find us some examples when you felt like you were actually you in the pulpit? I'm like, okay, great, no problem. You know, listening to yourself is a, like a form of like torture. Um, you know, it's like waterboarding, like listening or watching yourself. And, you know, it's bad enough. But then when all of a sudden you're looking for the one thing you thought you defined yourself by and you have a hard time finding it. And I have to admit, I was undone. I was undone. And my hope for the church of Laodicea is in this moment, they were undone. The very things they defined themselves by, it came to fruition and they were shown that things were not as they appeared. I preach scared for far too long. Far too afraid of what y'all thought. Trying to be somebody else for somebody else. And it was in that moment that all of a sudden God gave me a gift because he loved me. He didn't want me to live, minister, or preach from that place anymore. And you have to get the heart of God in bringing up these hard truths to the church in Laodicea. He comes because he loves. And he wants us to respond to his loving invitation. Because He doesn't come with empty promises. You see, he comes with himself. Who we read next? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, if you've been around the church, you've heard that, you've heard that passage a time or two, right? What's been the context? Evangelism. Who is Jesus actually talking to? A complacent church, a complacent person, a complacent people. The ones who should have known better. The ones who had all the trappings that they were a success. I mean, here's something to note. All the problems that we find in other churches, we don't find here. False teaching? Nope. Seem like they love their Bible. Uh, Do they have divisions? No, they seem to be fairly united. Do they have the things of the other churches? No they would be seen as a fairly healthy and prosperous church. This is the church we listen to their band on Spotify. This is the church we go to their conferences. This is the church we follow their preacher on Instagram and listen to him. This is that church. 
That when we show up, we look at their building, we look at their grounds, and we're so impressed. And do you see the, the heart of Jesus when he comes? He goes, none of this impresses me. Why? Because you don't need me. I guarantee the church of Laodicea thought Jesus was already in the room. What a surprise that was. He's just outside knocking. But I want you to see the promise here. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. No matter how far and long you have gone in your complacency, and if your state of not thinking that you actually really, really needed him, no matter how many places you've moved to, he keeps on showing up at your door. He's like those telemarketers. I'm like, I've changed my number three times. I've moved to four different houses. How did you find me? And yet he comes. And wherever you are, however far you run, he's standing there knocking. And here's what's beautiful about this. He says, he will come in and I will come in and I will eat with him and him with me. Now, there are a bunch of words that Jesus could have used in the Greek for this dining. Like there's literally a word that essentially means grab your granola bar and run. Like, like <laughs> there, there's a word that basically is kind of like grabbing snacks. But the word that Jesus chose to use here was the main meal that he invited the whole family to. That you took your time. And you see, the reason why riches and success were so threatening is because they were so distancing. Why did the water lose its usefulness and refreshment and healing powers by the time it got to Laodicea? There was too much distance. And you see, Jesus is closing the gap. He is standing outside ready to come in, but you got to recognize he's not in the room. You got to recognize that you have need. That the very things that have defined your life, your church, your persona come and amount to nothing. And you recognize, I really need you to come in. And when Jesus comes in, he brings the party with him. I don't know if you've ever had someone come up to your door that you were not expecting and you kind of question what their motivation was. There's no question here. He knocks and you can see him outside with this big smile, this look of love. And he's got like some barbecue <laughs> and a host of beverages, we'll say, in and tow. He's ready. He brings the best wine. He's got a box of wine and barbecue. Like he's ready to party. He's ready to come in. No matter how far off you've gone, he's knocking. And how Jesus ends this passage is essentially this. Are you going to let him in? Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. And you see, as I look at this passage, I, there is perhaps no better church that reflects the state of the church in America than the church at Laodicea. Yes. We have been blinded by our success. We have been numbed in complacency by our riches. And frankly, most of what we do could happen whether he's in the room or not. Years ago, during the Second Great Awakening, one of the revivalists by the name of Sunday, uh, Billy Sunday, a former baseball player, I had this one moment where he revealed this own reality in his own life. So confident in his abilities to draw people to Jesus, he said, all you got to do is dim the lights, put on the music, and let me talk, and I will bring them to Jesus. I don't need the Holy Spirit. Hold up. Unfortunately, the church in America has been playing that game ever since. We just ain't honest enough to admit it. And so this is the great threat and danger to the church 
What's the remedy? First, nearness. We got to get to the source. We got to stay near. And when the moments that we recognize we've moved down the street, we need to hear the knocking and voice of our Savior beckoning us to let him back in. You know how he gets near? He gets near as we get really, really needy. You know, I've said it before, I said it again. The church today looks far too much like a country club and not enough like a recovery room. That we are coming around wearing our Sunday best, putting on the part, speaking the right things, reading the right things. We're trying to give this persona that we have got our act together, that we're being in the thing, that we're successful. We do not like to show weakness. And what happens when we refuse to walk in dependency and neediness is that we rob ourselves in a relationship with Jesus and we rob ourselves of effectiveness in his kingdom. Remember, what was sickening to Jesus? That your life and your works are neither healing nor refreshing to the people around you because you put too much distance between me and you. And you refuse to see your need. The day the church rejoices in messiness and in the limitations of our humanity is the day where the spirit really starts to come and to do his thing and to do his work. When all of a sudden we boast in our weaknesses and out in our strengths, revival begins to break out. But when you have so much, are you willing to give it up to become little? Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't tell them to sell everything they have in this passage, does he? He doesn't tell them to sell everything and get poor. All he says is, just open the door. And when we embrace the neediness, we're going to find his nearness more evident in our life moment by moment. And here's the deal. He's kind of like my, this neighbor kid we used to live next to. That boy showed up every day. Like, he would pop up in the most weirdest of places. You're like, oh, Tyler, hey, hey, I didn't see you there, buddy. Like, he would just keep on showing up, and Jesus is like that. Every day he's showing up, knocking on your door, saying, you want to let me in? Because I got a party. And here's what I want you to do as we close. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you in your mind's eye to imagine your front porch. And I want you to think for a moment and imagine that Jesus is standing on your front porch. And I want you to think, what would it be like if he showed up to my house today, showed up my front door and started knocking? What are the areas of my life that I refuse intentionally or unintentionally to let down my guard and to show my weakness? What are the things that I define myself by in private and in public that Jesus is asking me to lay down and to let him in? Some of you, this might be a moment where you're surprised to realize that if you were took a close look at your life, that Jesus wasn't inside at your table. He was outside at your door. And this moment where there may be things stirring in your heart, in your mind, realities of the ways in which you pride yourself and define yourself with that are keeping you from him. When you're about to lean into toxic shame, saying, I should have known better. 
I, I should. I shouldn't have let it gone this far. I, sh- I, should, have, I should have figured this out earlier. I, I, sh- I shouldn't have done that. I, I shouldn't have. I just want you to hear his voice saying, none of that matters. I'm here now. Won't you let me in? Dear Heavenly Father, This room, I reckon, is full of people who should have known better. This room is full of people who may have assumed that Jesus was inside the house, not knowing he was outside at the door. Because we bought into the lie of our culture that we're defined by our external appearances. Worldly success the trappings that show that we got our act together. And Jesus is unexpectedly showing up our door when our house is an utter mess. No time to hide it in the closet. No time to sweep it on the rug. But just an invitation to open the door and let him in. And so Lord, I pray in this moment of weakness, of honest transparency, acknowledging the mess that stands in our living room and the Messiah who stands at our door and that we would be overwhelmed by the reality that he wants to come in. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to bring his nearness so that we would become like the sources of living water that bring refreshment and healing to the people and to the places around us. Oh Lord, I pray our lives and the church at large would begin to reflect the reality of your living waters and of your precious streams. That once again, refreshment and healing would come to the nations as Jesus flows to us, through us to those in need of his tender care. And so, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for knowing us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for promising us, for your promises are sure and true. We offer this now in Jesus' name. Amen.